Hello, everyone, and welcome to Registrar Corp's webinar on new USFDA food labeling requirements. My name is Jonathan Rhodes, a marketing specialist at Registrar Corp and today's moderator. The presentation will conclude with a live questions and answers session. If we run out of time, we are also happy to respond to your questions by email. You may submit a written question anytime during the webinar by using the Ask a Question feature in the top center of your webinar screen. A recorded copy of this presentation will be sent to all registrants. I'd like to introduce our speaker today. Anna Beneventi holds a Bachelor of Science degree in biology from the College of William and Mary in Williamsburg, Virginia. Ms. Beneventi has over eight years of analytical research experience. As a senior regulatory specialist at Registrar Corp, she has been assisting companies with US FDA regulations since 2009. She has researched thousands of products to determine whether they meet FDA requirements for compliance. Ms. Beneventi is based at Registrar Corp's headquarters in Hampton, Virginia, where she manages a team of 15 regulatory specialists. I'd like to go ahead and begin. Anna? Good morning, everyone, and thank you, Jonathan. It's a pleasure to speak with everyone today regarding FDA's new nutrition labeling requirements, which are vastly different than what was previously required. It's imperative that companies plan now on how to update their labeling to incorporate these new rules. In this webinar, we're going to be covering certain specific topics that are very important as part of this. So we'll be covering the regulatory history of nutrition labeling, the changes to content as a result of the new rules, reference amounts and serving sizes, formatting changes, record keeping requirements, the effective and compliance dates for these rules, as well as offering a summary and then a question and answer period. So to start things off, how did we actually get here? The current nutrition facts label had stayed relatively unchanged since the passage of the Nutrition Labeling and Education Act, which was in 1990. So for many of you who either are in the United States or have been exporting to the United States for a while, this nutrition facts panel looks very familiar. This is what has been on food packaging in the United States since 1990. However, FDA issued two proposed rules in 2014 to modify this label. Based on new research and nutritional data, they proposed changes to the format and content to factor in new concerns about uh, the health practices and the dietary practices of American consumers. So the proposed rule was designed to address those particular concerns. There was also a supplemental proposed rule issued in 2015 that addressed a new term and a new nutrient category called added sugars, which was to be distinct from the total sugars found in the product. Then in May of 2016, two significant final rules were issued that drastically modified the nutrition facts label. The first one was food labeling, revision of the nutrition and supplement facts labels, and the second one, the serving sizes of foods that can be reasonably be consumed at one eating occasion, dual column labeling, which was a brand new mandatory requirement, updating, modifying, and establishing certain reference amounts customarily consumed, as well as establishing serving sizes for breath mints. Now, the final version of the Nutrition Facts label is dramatically different than both the 1990 and the 2014 versions. So as you see here, this is the new final version issued in 2016 of what we call the standard format of the Nutrition Facts chart. It's important to understand that the 1990 version Nutrition Facts chart as well as the proposed but never finalized 2014 Nutrition Facts chart, pretty soon will no longer be acceptable on food labels in the United States. This is the final version that must be implemented by companies by the compliance dates established by FDA. So 
So the first question that people tend to ask is what new information is FDA requiring? The content changes to the nutrition facts chart are quite significant. First and foremost, the mandatory declarations for certain nutrients have changed. Vitamin D and potassium are now mandatory declarations, whereas before they were voluntary. Vitamins A and C, which used to be mandatory, are now voluntary. These changes are as a result of new understanding of the nutritional needs of the average American consumer. Vitamins A and C are no longer a concern, according to the research that's been conducted, but vitamin D and potassium are, hence the change. Calories from fat may no longer be declared at all as part of the chart. This is due to FDA's understanding that it's the type of fat in a product that has the most significance versus the number of calories from fat. Fluoride is also now a voluntary declaration. And sugars are now to be declared as total sugars to distinguish them from the new added sugars declaration. It's important to understand also that total sugars is not limited just to sucrose. It includes mono and disaccharides and therefore would include lactose, fructose, and other saccharides, not just sucrose. Added sugars must be declared when they're present in certain amounts. And we'll talk a little bit further in the presentation about what FDA means by added sugars. Quantitative amounts for the four mandatory vitamins and minerals must be given in the standard format chart, whereas before only the percent um, daily value was given, now the quantitative amount must be given as well. There have been some modifications to the declarations for folate and folic acid, as well as new units for vitamin D, niacin, vitamins A, and E. The declaration for dietary fiber has also undergone quite a bit of change according to the new rules. Previously, there really wasn't a definition for dietary fiber per se, so FDA has modified the definition in the regulation for dietary fiber to include only those with, quote, demonstrated beneficial physiological effects. So the regulation itself states that this includes non-digestible, soluble, and insoluble carbohydrates and lignin that are intrinsic and intact in plants. It, they also have identified certain isolated or synthetic fibers, beta-glucan soluble fiber, psyllium husk, cellulose, guar gum, pectin, locust bean gum, and hydroxypropyl methylcellulose in the regulation as counting towards the dietary fiber declaration. So it's important to understand that only those fibers mentioned in the regulation at this point can be included in the quantitative amount of fiber declared in that chart. However, FDA has stated it will review data on additional fibers for potential inclusion in the regulation. Just this past June, FDA issued guidance document informing industry of the agency's intent to use enforcement discretion relative to certain fibers. So as mentioned on the previous slide, FDA has reviewed the data that's submitted by industry um, about certain isolated and synthetic non-digestible carbohydrates. So this guidance identifies certain ones that may be included in the declared amount of dietary fiber. So it's important for industry to understand that FDA is shifting the burden of proof to industry to provide the data necessary for FDA to determine if a fiber should be included in the definition and count towards that quantitative amount. So these are the additional fibers that are mentioned in that guidance document. And again, this means that these can be included in the declaration of dietary fiber on the nutrition facts chart under the new rules. Added sugars is a new declaration that is mandatory in certain situations under the new final rules. The declaration of added sugars was deemed important by FDA because of the amount of added sugars 
that have been added to the American diet over the last few decades and the health concerns that result from it. So added sugars include those that are either added to food or packaged as such, sugars such as free mono and disaccharides, syrups and honey, including those that are in single ingredient packages, i.e. pure maple syrup in a package to put on your pancakes, technically counts as an added sugar. Sugars from concentrated fruit or vegetable juices that are in excess of what would be expected from the same volume of 100% fruit or vegetable juice of the same type. So in essence, the difference between the same amount of 100% juice versus the concentrate, the difference between those two sugar values would be considered added sugars. FDA provides the following as examples of added sugars, brown sugar, white table sugar, corn syrup, high fructose corn syrup, dextrose, fructose, invert sugar, maltose, as well as trehalose. But added sugars does not include these particular types of sugars, single strength or 100% fruit juices, fruit juices which are concentrated from 100% juices sold to consumers, which a consumer will then reconstitute to 100% fruit. So for example, frozen concentrated orange juice that will be added to water to reconstitute to 100% juice. Fruit or vegetable juice concentrates used under the total juice percentage label declaration or for brick standardization. Fruit juice concentrates used to formulate jellies, jams, and preserves, the fruit component of fruit spreads, and sugar alcohols. After the issuance of these final rules, there was a pretty strong negative response from the industry regarding the added sugars declaration, specifically from the manufacturers of honey, maple syrup, as well as cranberry products. Uh, they were, in reading the final rule when it was issued, those comments took up quite a few pages, quite frankly. Um, a lot of these manufacturers objected to the added sugars declaration for their products. The producers of products such as pure honey and pure maple syrup expressed concern that the consumer would assume that it was adulterated, that the products were not pure and had added sugars and other types of saccharides added to the product. Producers of cranberry products cited the need for sugar to make the products palatable as, for example, dried cranberries that have not been added with sugar often can't be eaten just because of the tartness. And that when you do add sugars to the cranberries, they result in no greater number of added sugars than you find in other fruits. As a result of these concerns, FDA issued a draft guidance in February of 2018, which allows for a special declaration for these particular products. It allows for the obelisk symbol to be adjacent to the declaration of the percent DV for added sugars. So added sugars do still have to be declared, but the symbol can direct the consumer to an explanation regarding the meaning of added sugars for this type of product. Now, FDA since then has issued a constituent update in June that announces the receipt of additional comments that still criticize the agency's approach, and so they're planning to work with industry to, quote, devise a sensible solution, unquote. So at this point in time, it appears that the honey, maple syrup, and cranberry products, it will apply to the single ingredient packages of pure honey, pure maple syrup, and certain dried cranberry and cranberry juice products that are sweetened with added sugars, but contain total sugars that are comparable to naturally occurring sugars in typical fruits. So these are the statements that FDA uses as examples for these particular types of products. So on the left, for example, you'll see an example of 100% cranberry juice. You see the total sugars declaration is 25 grams. And given the natures of cranberries, 23 grams of added sugars are present in order to make the product palatable. And you can see the disclaimer that is given offered up as an example by FDA to explain why there are added sugars in this type of product.
On the right-hand side, you see an example from a pure honey product. This might be very similar to what you might find for pure maple syrup as well. So you'll see the total sugars declaration and the added sugars declarations are identical because pure honey consists of all of these sugars and all of them are considered added sugars. To combat the perception that the product might be adulterated with other types of sugars in addition to honey, FDA offers up the example you see below to clarify to the consumer that all the sugars are naturally occurring in honey. As I mentioned on the previous slide, industry does not appear to be satisfied with these options. Uh, and again, FDA has stated they're going to work on a sensible solution with industry. As it stands right now, however, these do appear to be appropriate and recognized by the agency under enforcement discretion and can be added to the labels for these types of products. Also as part of the final rules and the evaluation of nutritional data that FDA has received over the years, they took into account the daily reference values and the reference daily intake values for many nutrients and modified them to reflect new understandings of the nutritional needs of the American consumer. It's sort of interesting in that some of the modifications seem to be counterintuitive, um, but they are based on nutritional data that FDA has. For example, total fat, the daily value for total fat actually increased from 65 grams to 78 grams, but the total carbohydrate uh, value decreased from 300 grams to 275 grams. Again, this reflects new understandings of nutritional data and the foods that we eat. Sodium was decreased slightly. Potassium had a monumental increase in the daily value. And again, moderate increases for calcium and dietary fiber. As added sugars did not exist as a declaration prior to the new rules, FDA went ahead and established the daily reference value for added sugars at 50 grams, meaning that the agency states that American consumers really should not have more than 50 grams of added sugars in a day as part of their diet. Now, the impact of this uh, will, of course, be the value of the percent daily value declared on the label, but it also impacts whether or not a product can make certain nutrient content and health claims. So these updated DRV and RDI values mean that products that previously could make claims such as low sodium or high fiber may not be able to do so under the new rules. So the agency's approach on this is once you actually change your label to incorporate the new nutrition facts chart, you have to conform to these DRV and RDI changes as well. So for example, to make the claim a good source of calcium, which means 10% of the RDI, under the old rules, it required 100 milligrams per serving, but under the new rules, it requires 130 milligrams per serving. Similarly, a claim such as rich in potassium, which would require 20% of the RDI, under the new rules requires 700 milligrams per serving, or under, sorry, under the old rules requires 700 milligrams per serving, but under the new rules would require 940 milligrams per serving. So it's also important to understand how serving sizes have changed with the new rules. Uh, many companies assume that they can simply take their old nutrition facts chart, put it into the new format, and they're done but that's not exactly the case. Reference amounts and serving sizes can change dramatically based on the new rules. So the basis of the serving size is the reference amount customarily consumed per eating occasion, or as we call it, the rack value. This is determined by FDA's review of consumer consumption data. So it reflects what we actually eat not as some people assume of what we should eat. And many of the rack values have been changed to reflect the new consumption data that FDA reviewed leading up to the final rules. So some of the notable changes, and please note this is not an exhaustive list, but certain beverage racks were increased from 240 milliliters to 360 milliliters, such as sodas and bottled water. 
So this is going to have a dramatic impact on the labeling of, for example, a 500 milliliter bottle of water. The all other candies rack value was actually decreased from 40 grams to 30 grams. The ice cream rack increased from one half to two thirds of a cup. And they established some new categories, including those for appetizers and an after dinner confectionery. So for example, this is how a rack value can impact the serving size declarations on a product. For example, if you have an 85 gram chocolate bar, the previous serving size based on the 40 gram rack would have been the proportion of the bar closest to that value. So your serving size would have been a half of a bar. However, the new serving size would be based on the 30 gram rack and that would result in the serving size of one third of a bar. And as you can imagine, the entire content of the nutrition facts chart would then also change and would reflect lower values than on the previous label of a half a bar. So now that we understand how the content has changed, the next question would be, how will the new label actually look? And again, the formatting changes are quite substantial compared to the old nutrition facts chart from 1990. So on our standard format, you can see some of the changes have been identified here. FDA changed the order of many of the nutrients. So for example, potassium is no longer in the top half of the chart. It's actually been placed with the vitamins and minerals down there at the bottom, as you see. Changes were made to the footnote, the footnote being that last statement at the bottom that describes the percent daily value. Under the old rule, there was a lengthy footnote that included the daily values for all of these nutrients. So thankfully, in the eyes of many, FDA has abbreviated this to the statement that you see at the bottom of this standard chart. Changes were also made to the font sizes of the declarations. Given some of the health concerns related to the diet of the American consumer, you can see the calorie count font size has been increased dramatically. FDA also boldened the serving size declaration and reversed its order with servings per container. Also, the quantitative amounts of certain vitamins and minerals are required. So you can see at the bottom, the quantitative amounts for the vitamins and minerals, such as calcium and iron, are present, whereas under the old rules, only the percent daily value was given. Now, many of you may also be aware that there are several different versions of the Nutrition Facts chart that are dependent on the product and the container to determine whether or not a label can actually bear one of these modified labels. The simplified label is permitted when a product meets certain FDA requirements related to nutritional content. In essence, foods that meet uh, uh, certain qualifications for not containing certain nutrients may qualify for the simplified label. Classic examples would include olive oils and other types of oils, candy, soda, water, things like that. So you can see here are two examples of the nutrition facts chart for a simplified label. There are certain mandatory nutrients that must always be declared, whether they're present or not, and then the simplified chart requires that any others that's present in a significant amount be included. So the use of the simplified chart is quite advantageous when you're trying to conserve label space if the product qualifies. The tabular label is now is permitted when a product packaging is below a certain size. Please note that to qualify for tabular, it's based on the size of the container, not on the, the size of the label that's attached to the container. And you see two examples here. The one on the top is the tabular chart for small packages less than 40 square inches in most cases. The one on the bottom is for larger packages but ones that meet a certain requirement for the height of the information panel. You can also see that many of the modifications to the standard were kept for the tabular, including the increased size for the calorie declaration. The linear chart is only permitted when the tabular chart does not fit on the product packaging, 
and the product is under a certain size, the product package is under a certain size. So this should only be used when the tabular does not fit. Uh, personal anecdotes, we have encountered situations where FDA has detained products because the packaging declares a linear label when a tabular could have fit. So this is sort of the last ditch effort to fit, to fit a label on or nutrition facts chart on a label. And you can see it's not very readable and that's the reason why FDA only permits it in certain circumstances. Now dual column labels are a new requirement. Dual column labels existed in a mostly voluntary format under the old rules, but now FDA has mandated dual column labels for certain products. For products that are in packaging that is 200 to 300% of the rack value, such as a 75 gram bag of chips, a dual column label will be required. For products that are in discrete units, such as a 250 gram muffin that are 200 to 300% of the rack, a dual column label will also be required. And this is to ensure that a consumer has the nutritional information for packages that could be consumed in one sitting. There are some exemptions from the dual column requirement, um, but the baseline requirement is here. So for example, on the left, we have a nutrition facts chart in the dual column that is for a package that's between 200 to 300% of the rack value. So you can see that a consumer has access to the information per serving as well as for the full container. Similarly, on the right-hand side, the now classic muffin example for dual column labels shows you the serving size, which should be half of a muffin, that nutritional content is provided, but then also for the entire muffin, because the muffin is between 200 to 300% of the rack value, that information must also be shared as the consumer could eat the entire muffin in one sitting. So the next important question to ask yourself is if there's any data that you need to be keeping as part of the nutrition labeling on your products. In essence, the records for nutrient declarations must be kept for nutrients for which analytical methods are not available. So this might be an analysis from nutrient databases, such as the USDA nutrient database, any sort of recipes or formulations or batch records that were used to determine the appropriate nutritional content that will be declared on a product. So for example, records need to show when a product has a mixture of fibers that meet and don't meet the definition of dietary fiber. So for example, if you had a recipe that identifies the amount of isolated fibers that don't meet the definition that have been added to intrinsic fibers that were present due to a plant ingredient, you need to show how you did the math to determine the actual dietary fiber declaration. Also, for example, if you have a mixture of naturally occurring sugars and those that would be considered added sugars. So, for example, a juice blend beverage that's been made using water, 100% fruit juice, but also added sucrose, the added sucrose would be considered an added sugars. And so perhaps the recipe could be used to justify the added sugars declaration compared to the total sugars declaration. Also, any product that's been subjected to non-enzymatic browning that could result in a reduction of added sugars, that should be documented. Ones that have a mixture of different types of vitamin E or different types of folic acid, as well as naturally occurring folate. All of the records should be kept to show how the nutrient content was determined and then declared on the label. Now, the big question that many people have is how dietary supplements are being affected by this new rule. Dietary supplements fall under the umbrella of food and therefore can be impacted. However, the changes aren't nearly as dramatic as they were for conventional foods and beverages. So for example, with the content changes, the list of mandatory nutrients no longer includes vitamins A and C, similar to conventional foods. They've also replaced A and C with vitamin D and potassium and calories from fat are no longer permitted. 
The added sugars and total sugars declarations must be there if actually present in the product. And the changes and additions to the regulatory definitions for nutrients such as fiber will also apply. Now, the formatting changes are relatively minor compared to the nutrition facts chart. The size of the calorie declaration is not increasing. It's important to note, if you read the final rule and the resulting regulations, they state that the size of the calorie declaration is supposed to increase by two point font sizes. However, FDA has stated that the final rule was an error and it should be corrected in a technical amendment at some point. So again, the size of the calorie declaration will not increase in dietary supplement labeling. There's also a new disclaimer for supplements that are intended for children one to three years of age that modifies the footnote because their diets are based on a 1,000 calorie diet rather than a 2,000 calorie diet. So here are some label examples for the supplement facts chart. Those of you familiar with the chart will probably note that there aren't that many changes. For example, you can see there's an added sugars declaration and a total sugars declaration on the right-hand example. But generally speaking, the remaining parts of the format haven't really changed at all. So it is important that companies understand what the effective and compliance dates are for these rules. Again, these rules were issued in 2016, but FDA did not expect companies to change their labeling overnight. So the effective date of the rule, which is the date that everything goes into our Code of Federal Regulations, was July 26th, 2016. So again, the old regulations that mandated the old format of the chart are no longer in our Code of Federal Regulations. But as I mentioned, FDA understands that companies cannot change their labeling overnight, and so they issue what they call a compliance date, which would be the date upon which FDA expects companies to be in compliance. Now, there, the original compliance dates that were issued by FDA, along with the final rule, were what FDA considered appropriate at the time to allow industry time to incorporate the new rules into their packaging. And so this was based off the annual food sales of the manufacturer. So for large companies, the original compliance date was this month, July 26, 2018. For companies with sales of less than $10 million, and this is global, mind you, not U.S. sales, the compliance date was July 26, 2019. However, FDA has decided to extend the compliance date due to comments and concerns from industry regarding the amount of time necessary to update the packaging. Uh, it's also worth noting that FDA has not issued a new version of their food labeling guide to help industry understand FDA's intent with the new rule and how to incorporate it into packaging. So if you go to the FDA's food labeling guide, you'll note it still has the information for the old nutrition facts chart and should definitely not be used as you modify your packaging. So on May 4th, 2018, FDA issued a final rule, so this is firm now, uh, extending the original compliance dates to January 1st, 2020 and January 1st, 2021. So as you're planning ahead, understand that FDA issued the extension due to industry's concerns about the need to upgrade their labeling software, the need to obtain nutrition information from their suppliers, particularly for the new mandatory nutrients like vitamin D and potassium, just the sheer number of products that need new labels, particularly from the larger manufacturers who may have hundreds of SKUs. Uh, as shown in my rack example, if you have even the same product, like a chocolate bar, in two different sizes, you may have to change the serving size on one of the packages compared to the other. You simply can't take one nutrition facts chart and apply it to every single size of that product. Also, when you consider the dual column requirement, that also means that you simply can't take the same chart 
change the number of servings per container, and then add it to every single product package for that particular product. It's important to understand how these rules impact products in the different sizes so that the proper nutrition facts chart can be added. It also uh, means that certain companies may want to reformulate their product. For example, uh, a fiber bar, you know, one that's making claims about being high in fiber but has 25 grams of dietary fiber, might need to be reformulated so that that high fiber claim can still be made. Uh, it may require reformulation to include the fibers that are recognized by FDA as having the beneficial physiological effects. So again, companies need to take the time to really truly understand the impact of these rules on their products and then adjust accordingly. Also, the complexity of the revisions with the standard chart, the simplified, the tabular, the linear, the dual column charts, quite complex. And it's important to get it right the first time. Companies will have to undergo quite uh, an undertaking to change the labeling for the many products that they may manufacture, and you do want to get it right the first time. So companies should begin their revisions now to avoid the possibility of noncompliance due to unforeseen delays, needs for reformulation, and so forth. Now, FDA, or sorry, Registrar Corp does offer a food labeling review and ingredients for FDA compliance. Uh, one of the things that we did not get into with this webinar is how FDA regulates food ingredients, and it's important to know whether or not your ingredients are also in FDA compliance. And so our service includes a detailed report that's usually 60 to 100 pages prepared by my team of regulatory specialists who scrutinize every element of the food labeling. We update to the FDA's new food labeling format. We determine which type of chart the product qualifies for, be it simplified, tabular, linear, or standard, and also whether the dual column will be required. And we will provide you with a print-ready graphic file of the revised label, which can be used so that the product is in compliance when that compliance date hits for that particular company. So at this point in time, I'll go ahead and turn it over to all of you to see what types of questions that you might have and that we're happy to answer regarding any of the topics that we've discussed. Thank you, Anna, for that great presentation. Again, I'd like to announce that we will be sending a recorded copy of this webinar and a PDF copy of the presentation to all registrants. You may submit a written question at any time during the webinar by using the Ask a Question feature at the top center of your webinar screen. So let's go ahead and take our first question. Our first question, are polyalcohols, maltitol, sorbitol, et cetera, to be included under total sugars? Okay, thank you for the question. They are included under the total carbohydrates, um, they do have a different caloric value in the regulation than other types of saccharides. And so they do end up being included under that total carbohydrates value, not necessarily total sugars though. Thank you, Anna. Our next question, what are the effects of the new regulations on dietary fiber to the test methods? So depending on the test methods that are used, some may or may not be able to determine whether the dietary fiber result of the testing is due to those fibers that are included in the definition or if it does include those that are not included in the definition. So this is the, the challenge that the new rules present to industry because prior to this, there was no definition for dietary fiber and so whatever your testing result was for dietary fiber generally could be used as the declaration for dietary fiber in the chart. Companies now are tasked with determining the exact nature of the fibers in their product to determine whether or not they are intrinsic to plant ingredients or whether they are isolated or synthetic dietary fibers that may or may not be recognized by FDA as having beneficial physiological effects and whether or not they can or can't be included in that dietary fiber definition. So usually this will involve 
analyzing the recipe for that particular product, identifying those fibers, and how much each of those fibers contributes to that overall dietary fiber value. Thank you, Anna. Our next question, if I am using candied fruit in my product, do I have to specify the added sugar percentage of the candied fruit as well? Okay, thank you for the question. This is a really good example if I'm understanding what you mean by candied fruit. So for example, if this is a dried fruit that has had sugar added to it, the saccharide value of the fruit itself is not considered an added sugar, but the amount of you know white table sugar or sucrose that's been added to that would be. So for example, you might have a total sugars value of 20 grams, but only five grams of that might be considered added sugar to reflect the sucrose that's been added to the product. Thank you, Anna. Does maple sugar need to be included in added sugars? Maple sugar would be considered an added sugar, both if it's used in a finished product or if it's packaged all by itself. So for example, brown sugar, white sugar, maple sugar, honey, maple syrup, all of those that are generally added to other products, uh, for example, either by a manufacturer or something like maple sugar or maple syrup where it's being added to you know, pancakes or waffles, those all are considered added sugars because they're added sugars to the American diet. It's not that they're being added to another product necessarily. So a single ingredient sugar must include that amount as added sugars as well as total sugars. Thank you, Anna. What mistakes are allowed, what mistakes allow the FDA in the declaration of the nutrition value? Is it still 20%? So if I'm understanding that correctly, what mistakes are allowed in the declaration of nutrition values? So uh, I believe this question is referring to the allowances that are written into regulation for the accuracy of the nutritional content declared in the nutrition facts chart. So the regulations remain unchanged. And so for certain nutrients, there is an allowance of about 20% for the declared value with for example, if FDA were to test it, the actual value of the product. So that part of the regulation has not changed. Thank you, Anna. Our next question, am I permitted to sell in the USA a product which the labeling is in conformance with INCO regulations, uh, aka the European requirements for labeling, with a sticker quoting the FDA required nutrition facts? So this is a common inquiry that we receive because many companies, particularly if they're just starting to ship to the United States, the cost of overhauling their entire labeling stock is quite substantial and might not be supported by the amount of product they anticipate selling in the United States. So it really depends on the packaging. And there are a few issues that this approach will encounter. You can add a sticker as long as it's firmly affixed and it has, you know, the nutrient, you know, the proper nutrition facts chart and all the proper format, et cetera. But what companies will run into is that EU labeling tends to have a number of languages on it. And FDA requires that if there's a foreign language, so a non-English language present on the labeling, all mandatory information has to be repeated in that language. So if you have a product with three or four or five different languages on it, FDA regulations state that you have to repeat all the mandatory FDA information, including that chart, in every single language. So this can be quite burdensome if you're trying to use a sticker option. Also, certain statements have to be presented in certain places on the label. So, for example, you might need to add also a sticker to the front of the package to declare the product identity and the net contents, for example, as well as presenting it in every language present on the label. So it really kind of depends. Uh, it's not unusual for us to try and come up with a sticker option for our clients, but know going in that it's often um, quite difficult to do. Thank you, Anna. Our next question 
are the racks defined by the FDA mandatory or can I change them? Okay. So by definition, the serving size is determined by the rack value. Uh, now the rack is sort of a starting point. So for example, if you have a product that is a snack uh, and the snack rack value is 30 grams, you won't necessarily declare your serving size is exactly 30 grams. There's a convoluted bunch of rules that dictate how you determine the serving size based off that rack value, but it is required that you base it off the rack value. For products that don't have a rack value, FDA has a way to, in essence, request one from the agency so that you can be sure that your product labels are in compliance. Thank you, Anna. Can we start changing our label details from now, or do we have to wait until 2020? You most certainly want to start changing them now. Um, as I mentioned before, the old labeling regulations have been removed from our code. Um, because of the amount of time necessary for companies to change the packaging, FDA will still allow products with the old chart to come through port. They'll allow companies to continue to use their old labeling stock. But when 2020 arrives, they're going to expect any products that are newly introduced into uh, U.S. commerce to have the new nutrition facts chart. Thank you, Anna. If candy products only contain carbohydrates, sodium, and sugars, all other quantities are zero, how do I declare this on the label? Will the use be simplified for beverages? Okay, so this is a, a good example, actually. If you have a candy that only has carbohydrates, sodium, perhaps as a result of uh, you know, sodium benzoate as preservative, and sugars, but no fiber, no fat, no cholesterol, uh, you know, no vitamins or minerals. That's a good example of when the simplified chart often can be used for that type of product. Uh, for beverages, it can vary depending on the nature of the beverage and what the nutritional content of the beverage is. So for example, a fruit juice may or may not qualify for the simplified chart, but something like a soda, which typically is water and sugar and maybe sodium benzoate, natural flavors or artificial flavors, something like that might go ahead and, and qualify for the simplified chart. Thank you, Anna. Our next question, are meat products regulated by the U.S. Department of Agriculture required to have a label change by the FDA, by the FDA's new label rules? Okay. So, USDA products have a separate set of labeling requirements in a completely different section of the Code of Federal Regulations. However, USDA tends to mimic what FDA does, and usually after the fact. So right now, the USDA labeling regulations are their old version, which again mimics the FDA version quite closely. Uh, USDA has stated that they intend to follow FDA's lead with the new formatting. However, they haven't actually issued any rules yet for it, but USDA has stated that they will recognize and use enforcement discretion to allow meat products to use the new FDA format. So while they haven't actually proposed it yet, it's quite probable that USDA will simply follow FDA's lead and eventually add this new format to the USDA labeling regulations as well. Thank you, Anna. Our next question is a two-parter. The statement of added sugars should be made according to what the manufacturer has in his formula or a laboratory analysis, and how long should these records be kept? Okay. So the record should be kept at least two or three years. Um, and I don't know the exact amount written into regulation, but I can certainly find that out for you. If you want to go ahead and email the uh, address that's shown up on the slide, we'll be happy to give you the exact amount of time FDA's regulations state they should be kept. Added sugars is very similar to the dietary fiber example from before. A lab analysis will usually give you the total amount of mono and disaccharides that are in 100 grams of the product, 
but lab analysis cannot distinguish between, for example, fructose that might be present due to a fruit ingredient versus fructose that might have been added as an isolated sugar intended to sweeten the product. So this is where recipes come into play, where companies require that you determine of that sugar content how much is naturally occurring due to something like a fruit ingredient, and then how much of it is actually falling under the definition of added sugars. So again, that recipe is going to be critical to making sure that your value is accurate and appropriate. Thank you, Anna. Our next question, are these requirements for both bulk and retail products? So FDA does have some exemptions from the Nutrition Facts Panel requirement for certain bulk products. For example, if a product is being uh, distributed solely to restaurants or delicatessens or other similar types of venues or for food service, those may not be required to declare a Nutrition Facts Panel provided that no other nutritional information and no other claims, such as low calorie, are present on the label. By having any nutritional information on the panel or uh, a claim such as high in fiber, you lose that exemption. So anything that is shipped also directly to a manufacturer for further processing is not going to have the requirement of the Nutrition Facts Panel. The Nutrition Facts Panel is really intended for the consumer in a retail setting to know the content of the packaging so that American consumers can make good nutritional choices. Thank you, Anna. How can a company figure out if their product needs a dual column panel? What are the official guidelines? So the dual column panel is based off of the amount of the product that's in the packaging compared to what the reference amount is. So if a, so for example, for the chips example that I gave on the slide, chips are considered a snack. So it's about a 28, 30 gram uh, rack value, uh, depending on the nature of the snack. And so a 75 gram bag is between 200 and 300 percent of that rack value. So it has to have the dual column chart. So again, the muffin example is pretty obvious. When you have a discrete unit such as a muffin, uh, if that discrete unit is 200 to 300 percent, then you have to have the per serving, which would be the fraction of the unit that most closely approximates the rack value, but then also the nutritional content for the entire unit. Thank you, Anna. Our next question, since there is no RDI for protein, can we make a protein claim for cheese, for example? So there is actually a daily value for protein, which is generally 50 grams for adults and uh, your children four and up. So the reason that you don't tend to see it on labeling, though, is because the manner in which the percentage has to be determined requires a pretty expensive set of testing. And FDA understands that many companies, it's a bit cost prohibitive to determine that percent daily value. Also, because a lack of protein is not a concern for the average American diet, the declaration of the percent isn't quite as important as, say, for vitamin D or potassium. So it's important to understand that there is actually a daily value for protein. It's just that many companies choose not to do the testing to determine the percent daily value for the purposes of nutrition labeling. However, if you want to make a protein claim, say you want to say it's high in protein, your cheese product, then you need to do the testing to determine the appropriate percent daily value and then make sure that it meets the requirements for a high in protein claim or a good source of protein type claim. Thank you, Anna. Our next question, is less than 40 square inches for linear labels applied to just the side of the container that the label is applied to? Okay. So 40 square inches is sort of the magical number in FDA labeling regulations. And it's the cutoff mark where in most, but not all cases, the tabular or linear charts may be used. It is based off of the surface available to bear labeling of the entire 
container. So some people misinterpret it to think, meaning the size of the label that's attached to the container, and that's not correct. It's the entire surface available to bear labeling on the entire container. So it would be all sides of the box. It would be the entire circumference of a bottle, although FDA will allow you to omit from the calculation the neck and the cap of the bottle, but know that it's not based on the size of the label or a particular side of the packaging. Thank you, Anna. Our next question, we are a chocolate making company. We use industrial chocolate, which includes sugar already in it. So we do not add the sugar in our factory. What do we do in this case? Okay, so in a case like this, this is a good example of why FDA is allowing additional time because people in situations like this have to actually go to their suppliers to find out what the nutritional content of the ingredients might be. So if you are buying a sweetened chocolate ingredient to then incorporate into your product, you are responsible for determining the amount of added sugars, for example, in that particular ingredient because it has to be included in the nutrition facts chart on your product. The nutrition facts chart on any finished product has to reflect the nutritional content within the packaging. And so it's the responsibility of the manufacturer to ensure that they have all the information necessary to make sure that those declarations are accurate. Thank you, Anna. In our cookies, we use malt syrup and blackstrap molasses. Are these products considered added sugars? Okay. So quite probably, depending on the function of them in your product, it may be considered added sugars. Uh, again, companies are tasked with figuring out the function of their ingredients and the number of added sugars that they contribute to the product. Thank you, Anna. Our next question, which side would you define as the PDP or principal display panel of a circular tin with biscuits, for example? Can the bottom be used as the information panel? Okay. So this question references uh, some FDA terminology that I'll quickly go over uh, in case some of you are not familiar with it. The PDP, as Jonathan said, is the principal display panel. It's the panel that faces the consumer uh, on a retail shelf. The information panel is then defined as the panel immediately to the right of the principal display panel. So for a circular tin, the PDP is considered to be 40% of the circumference and the section of the label that faces the consumer. So then the information panel would be the panel immediately to the right. The bottom of a tin should not be used as the information panel. Uh, I know it happens quite often, um, but FDA has issued warning letters in the past that state that the bottom is not an appropriate place for the mandatory information that has to appear on the information panel. The information panel should contain the nutrition facts chart, the declaration of ingredients, and the declaration of the manufacturer, packer, or distributor. There are some exemptions from the information panel having to be immediately to the right, uh, so, for example, small packages may be able to present that information anywhere on the packaging, but the bottom of the tin is not an appropriate place. So we strongly recommend not putting any sort of mandatory nutrition information on the bottom of the package. Thank you, Anna. We will now take our last question. Does the compliance date mean that products labeled on that day need to comply to the new regulation or does it mean that products put on the shelf in stores that day need to comply? Meaning, can manufacturers use old labels until December 31st, 2019, or do they need to change them earlier? So FDA has stated that they don't intend to pull products from the shelves. They don't intend to disrupt supply chains with products that have old labels still on them. However, they expect any products that are labeled as of January 1st, 2020 for the large companies to have the new nutrition facts labeling. So 
we strongly encourage people to go ahead and get these changes made now so that it's not even a question, should FDA ask. If a product has an old label on it after the compliance date, FDA could ask a company to prove that it was labeled prior to January 1st. So it's best just not to even find yourself in that situation. And it really is best to go ahead and make these changes now. Thank you, Anna. We are out of time, but you can send us additional questions anytime by email to info at registrarcorp.com. This concludes our presentation. Thank you for joining us today.